touring, it, it keeps me, it gives me a really good reason to stay fit and to be strong. And I think it kind of helps you stay youthful. Having something physical in your life there as a job, I think it works really well. Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Christian Giri Murphy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. We are on location this week at Olympic Studios, which used to be one of the great recording studios in London, but is now a cinema and members club, partly because it's quite close to my guest's house, because he is Simon Le Bon, the lead singer and lyricist from Duran Duran, one of the biggest selling pop and rock acts ever and an iconic group of the 1980s. They are still together, still writing new music and still touring this year, having been Princess Diana's favourite band, and the favourite band of, well, pretty much everybody from my generation um, for a long, long time. So Simon, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. You, you were, by repute, Princess Diana's favourite band. Right. Um, is that true? Um, did you, I mean, what was she like? You met her? Yes, um, we all met her. I met her. I used to meet her at the Harbour Club when she worked out there. Um, whether we were actually her favourite group is something that, well, I, yeah, then I don't know why she would have said that we were her favourite group. If we weren't, did, you know, did, did she say it to look cool or because she thought that that was what the kids were thinking at the time or other girls were? Because I think that that's quite disrespectful to the memory of her, if you think so. I, I tend to think, well, that's what she said, so take it at face value. And what was she like? Fun. Fun, yeah. But also, slight, you know, she was vulnerable. Um, and I think people, that, I, I do think that she had a very rough time at the, ha in the, hand, at the hands of the press, you know, but she, you know, she was also strong, you know, because of what she said and, and the way she, you know, bucked against a marriage that clearly wasn't happy for her. You know, she wasn't prepared to just keep quiet and put up with it because it was all those guys. Um, how do you feel about going on, on tour now, given you've been doing this for 40 years? Oh, I can't wait to get back on tour. Um, I've been at home for way too long. I'm getting, get, getting on all the family's nerves. Um, it's a great job to have. How different is it now to back then? It's, it's very different. Um, you know, we used to, uh, the big difference really is that the show itself has become so much more of a focus of the tour. You know, I think we used to go on tour in the, first, in, in the past thinking that it was basically a lot of parties that we could go to and we just did the live shows to keep, to, to, to finance our travel around the world and to be able to go to these parties. But now the show is the party and you know, everything in your, in your day is, um, is uh, just, everything is focused on making that show the best possible thing, the best possible event, the best possible moment, the joining of the audience and the music and the band, um, the best possible experience for everybody. I mean, you have to be really quite fit. I mean, I... I've just come back from three weeks filming abroad and I'm exhausted. I mean, you're going I, on a long tour. I don't know how you're <laughs> going to do it. You've got, to, you've got to stay fit. I mean, in life you've got to stay fit, haven't you? I mean, that, I think that's one of the big difference, differences between our generation and maybe our parents' generations. If they stayed fit, it was because they worked into, into old age. Um, we have the luxury of, 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 of leisure time and keeping our bodies strong. The album around which this tour is based, Future Past, yes. I mean, the, the music obviously is, is instantly recognisable as Duran Duran, but, is, but is, is new as well. You know, you've got new artists and collaborations and um, it's, it's, it's a creative work. How, how does that, how do you fit them in around the monster hits of Duran Duran? 
We've got a kind of, we've got a, an idea that people want to hear no more than about 30% or one third new, mu new music when they come to a Duran Duran show. The other two thirds you've got to play hits and album tracks. So, and we like to mix it up. You know, you don't want to play four new songs consecutively. People start to get a bit twitchy in the crowd, you know. They want something familiar. They want something that they can sing and, along to, and that they that. know. Absolutely. I mean, that, it's, that is the way it is. Um, and no matter how much you would like it to be different, it's not going to be. Um, and, and we accept that that is how it is. Our number one aim when we go on stage is to give people a good time. When you look back now on, on <clears throat> the 80s, um, I mean, it, it's hard to explain to people now quite how big you were at that time and how right. different things were, pre-internet, pre-Spotify, mm. how important radio play was and yeah. TV appearances yeah. and you I mean, the first Princess thing Diana's favourite band, you know, and that's, all right. that kind of stuff is totally... I mean, I think the first thing to kind of to get across really is the fact that there weren't as many acts around. Now with the internet, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people making music in their bedrooms, in their garages, some of them in studios, some are very, very, very successful. You know, we have super, superstars right now. Um, but you also have lots and lots and lots of tiny little artists or people who aren't as successful, but they've still got an audience because of the internet. Um, and so it's, there is this big, I don't know how to describe it. It's like the wallpaper's got a lot of pattern in it. When we started, there was only a couple of patterns in the wallpaper, and we were lucky enough to be one of them, which meant that, which meant that if, you were, if you did get success, a lot of attention was on you. A lot more attention, I think, comparatively. How, how reliant were you on, on a record company and, and the industry making you what you were? I think the industry in general, if you mean, and, it, and I think by that we're talking about media in general. So radio, television, um, then there's the industry of the live show, and then there's the recording industry as well. If you put that all together, we're just a part of it. We really are, but we're a very crucial part. I mean, the rest of the industry doesn't exist without us, but I don't think we could have had the kind of success that we did have without the backing of this incredible team. You know, we had a great team behind us. We had EMI Records. We had, we had Paul and Michael Barrow, the managers. You know, we had Russell Mulcahy and, and Eric Fellner um, doing videos for us. You know, it, it, was, it was a big, big team. I don't think anybody has huge success these days without having a big team behind them. It's very easy to see solo artists and think, oh my God, they do it all on their own. But they don't. You know, there's a lot of people in the background making these things come together and making them work. And is, is that lack of ego perhaps why the band has lasted so long? I think partly, I mean, well, yes. The biggest, the biggest reason that we've stayed together for so long is that we split everything equally. There's no, nobody gets paid more than anybody else. That's number one reason, I think. You, I, I've heard so many stories about um, acts, <clears throat> bands rather, who have broken up because two of them get all the publishing, two of them write the songs. They say, well, we write the songs, so we, need, we, we should get all the money for it. Um, we don't do that, and we never have. We've always split everything equally. I think that is a, and, and that is to do with ego as well. And when it comes to the band, ego is, t takes a second place to the success of the band. And we're all willing to sacrifice our egos for the good of the band. When I think back to um, Duran Duran, I, I, I kind of think you probably didn't get the credit that you deserved as musicians. Right. You know, that we saw you as pop stars and, 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 and you know, and rock stars, but but perhaps the you know the musical talent wasn't the first thing you thought of mm -hmm. when you thought about Duran Duran because you were such a package. You know mm -hmm. there was videos and yeah. fame and stardom and all that kind of thing. Um, and it's only now I think when I look back and I kind of go, well, actually that was that was really interesting. Yeah, well I think people t I think people have take music for granted generally, actually. 
Um, you know, there's, there's, there's always something that, that, dis that distracts from the music, whether it's us or whether it's Taylor Swift or Adele, you know? There's, but, the, the, but the actual songwriting is a very important part of, of everybody's success in the music industry, whether you're writing for yourself or you're singing other people's songs. The um, it, good quality songwriting is a very, very important factor in it. But also as musicians, individually, you're right. all very strong. Yeah. And, and there were a lot of bands that did very, very well on not a lot of musical talent. Right. In truth. Yeah, but I, we, you know, we worked at it. And I don't think we started off um, necessarily as strong technically, uh, as strong musicians technically. Um, I, think our, I think our writing was better than our um, musical expertise at the time. I know I wasn't as good a singer as I am now. Um, and I think all of us have learned our instruments and musicality and learned more about sort of, you know, the shape of music generally. But our songwriting was something that was, was which kind of set us apart from other acts. You know, when we had songs like Hungry Like the Wolf, and it, it made people's ears prick up because it was so different from anything anybody had ever heard before. I mean, can, can, can a voice continue to get better over that amount of time? I mean, I'm quite surprised you say you're a uh -huh. better singer now than oh, you were I'm, I'm way better, yeah. H how come? I mean... I'm more relaxed, more powerful. I think singing is a, is a physical thing. And it depends on you keeping your whole body strong. So, you, you know, you've got to have strong legs because you've got to have a good, good base, good platform. You've got to have a strong um, core and diaphragm because that's your... That's your pump, and you've got to have strong muscles up here because you, you hold yourself rigid but relaxed in order to resonate. Do you train? I mean, do you practice every day? Um, I sing a lot anyway, yeah, yeah. And my wife says I talk a lot as well. <laughs> but what's also uh, unusual about you, I think, is that you know, mo most of us, I'm 53, most of us basically kind of listen to the music we've listened to all our lives. Right. We, we may discover a new thing once in a blue moon, mm -hmm. maybe from our kids or whatever it is, but essentially I'm kind of stuck in time. Um, you are now doing a radio show yeah. in which it's all about new music. Yes. How, how, how do you have the intellectual curiosity or the musical curiosity to keep discovering new things well, and liking them? It, I mean, it's funny you should mention that because this, I, I had this epiphany really about um, well, it was two years ago, it was near the beginning of lockdown. And, um, and my daughter started it off, actually. I came downstairs one morning and she was listening to BBC Radio 6 and, you know, some stuff. And I, and I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to toast my coffee. I really, I really, I said to her, listen, I really want to have Radio 4 on, you know, in that sort of grown up, sort of overgrown up sort of way. And, um, and she said, oh, Dad, call yourself a musician. You, you really... You don't even like music, especially new music. And I thought, huh? shock horror. God, I thought, she's right, actually. And I thought about the whole process of when, of when you're in a band. And, and I realised that something happens. When you come out of the studio after being in there for, for eight hours, well, in my case, three hours, um, <laughs> and you've been surrounded by your own music the whole time, you get into the taxi on the way home and... Um, uh, the taxi driver says to you, what do you want to put on the radio? And you say, do you know what? I've been working with music all day, actually. Um, maybe we'll have a bit of quiet. And something starts off there and, it, and, and you start and, you, and your kind of your perception, your, your whole kind of scope of perception maybe narrows down a tiny little bit and it keeps on as your career continues and if you're not careful it gets narrower and narrower and narrower until in the end all you ever listen to is the stuff you're working on and really the stuff that got you into a band in the first place which for me would be David Bowie, Paddy Smith, Sex Pistols, Punk, The Doors, a lot of stuff but, but mainly stuff that I was listening to in the 1970s and and maybe a few things along the way and i thought god she's right so i said to her can you help me I'm, I'm i really want to hear some new music and um she started uh, sort of feeding stuff through to me i remember the first the first song she said i needed to listen to there were two well, well i can't remember the name of the 
the second one, but well, there's a song by Thundercat called Them Changes, which is great. It's like a, he's like a kind of funk, he's like a jazz funk, a modern jazz funkster. Um, and the other one was, was, a, was, a, uh, was a track by Car Seat Headrest, which I can't remember. Um, I think it's called Martin, that's right. And, um, and it just started me on the thing and I got, and I, oh, another one was dry cleaning. She's, she's crazy about dry cleaning. She'd completely turn me on to that band. Do you know about dry cleaning? No. Oh, <laughs> well, you know that right now there's this thing called, this, it's called the spoken word movement. Yeah. There's a lot, of, there are a lot of music out there and people aren't actually singing over the top of the music. They're talking or they're shouting or they're, they're but they're communicating without singing a note. It's sort of a return to beat poetry. Almost, but this, but this is, and, there, and there's a lot of really, really, really great acts out there. Dry Cleaning is one of the best ones. Um, there's Snapped Ankles. Oh, there's so many of them. Courting, but they sing a bit. And anyway, I, I started getting into this music and, and I delved into it. And I found that there's this, there's this very deep, very wide pool of really good new music around by people I'd never heard of. And, and I, I wanted to find out more about it. And the only way you do that is just by going right into these rabbit holes and, and, and just getting stuck into it. So I spent most of my time during the, the first lockdown just listening to all this stuff. It was fantastic. And the way that you can listen to music now with the streaming platforms makes it so easy to get to anything you want to hear. How's that changed the way you enjoy listening to music then? You know, uh, have you stopped listening to Patti Smith and David Bowie? No, no, I still listen to, I still listen to them. But I, I, I listen to a lot more new stuff. But because it's a radio show, it's kind of become a bit of a job as well. And I have to do it. And I've had to come to terms with that. You know, because as soon as, as you're doing something for any other reason than pure pleasure, it, it kind of changes it. So I've had to be able to turn off the stuff that I don't like very quickly. That's very important. I've, when I listen to, to a new song, um, I give it, it's got about 30 seconds. And you've got to make a decision within 30 seconds whether you like it or not. If, I don't, if, I haven't, if it hasn't grabbed me in 30 seconds, it's gone. Yeah, because for most of us, even the canon of music we, are, we already know would take months to get through. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you might never listen to a song twice if you've listened to it your whole Right, absolutely. you're so right. And, that, and, and that's not what music should, should be, I think. I think, it, I think you should be able to, to rely on music to take you to a place sometimes or to open your head sometimes if it's new stuff or to take or to, to to just relax yourself and give you and, and familiarity is a really important part of it because it that, that's when it takes you to the place that you know you mentioned your daughter being pivotal in this and you, yeah. and you, you live in this very interesting setup which is sort of like a, a joint family mm. setup where all your all your grown-up kids and grandchildren it is are a, at home. yeah it's a sort of commune but it so we live in two buildings We've got, the, we've got the big house and then, we, then we've got a garden and there's another garden and another house and, it's all, and the gardens are joined. Um, we bought the house at the end for my mum because she was living on her own and, and she was lonely and getting on and um, she, she lived there for 20 years and then um, when she was gone then we decided to move my daughter Saffron and um, her partner and her and her big bump that she was getting at the time into that cottage. And um, since then, she's had two little boys. So we have two little grandchildren living there. But in our house, it's myself, Yasmin, um, at times two other daughters, plus another, f another yes, yeah, so it's about nine people in the big house, plus the plus the four down at the, at the cottage. So at times it's been 13 people living in the, in the, so how do you in the compound. Because for most people that's sort of an idea of hell. Even yes. living with your mother, you know, yeah. that kind of thing is yeah. really difficult, you know, for, often for, for, for your wife. How have you managed to manage this without, with, and presume it's harmonious? Um, it is harmonious most of the time. 
But of course, there are, you know, you're living, living with people you love. It's not always easy. You know, there's, 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 minor, there's minor frictions about all the normal things, like what's on telly, you know. I want to watch the football. Well, I want to watch the rugby. <laughs> um, but, but there's no family it, history of this, is there? This is something that's just no, been invented it, well, by the, you, is it? Or? Funny enough, there is more in Yasmin's family. You know, she comes from an Iranian yeah. family. Her dad was Iranian. And they, they have, they buy um, city um, tower blocks and, and move entire dynasties into those. And, but, that, you know, they've got walls in between them. But she, she was used to it. And I think with my mum, my mum got on with everybody. So she was a very easy person to start with, you know. I mean, just mentioning um, Yasmin's Iranian background, are, are, you, are you at all engaged with what's going on in Iran at the moment? With well, only the women's protests? We're, and... we're, very, we're engaged through what we, what we read in the newspapers and, and see on the television and hear on the radio, what the, the news tells us. Um, we've both done, made little statements and, and, and put them out there in support of the women, by the way. We've, we feel that uh, it's a very, very important movement. Because Yasmin's idea of what Iran is and could be are very different from what the people who are in charge of Iran currently think it could be and should be. Just you see, because that. her family came, you know, her family came really, they were, the, they were pre-revolution family. They, um, her father had moved to the UK way before. And um, I'm not saying that the Shah's regime was, was a particularly good one. But I think there was a lot more personal freedom in that time. You know, there's a lot more, there's a lot less. It's, it's a hard one, actually, because there's an awful lot wrong with the Shah's regime. But there's an awful lot wrong with the current regime as well. Because uh, uh, you're not associated with sort of political causes, particularly. Right. Although there were a lot of, you know, your contemporaries through music who have mm -hmm. been. Is that something you've avoided or is it just something you're not, <clears throat> you don't want to go there? Well, I think to begin with, we avoided it because because as a band, it would have been difficult to find some necessarily things that we all actually agreed on, you know? And if you're, going to, if you're going to represent the whole band, and it's a proper democracy, and our band is a democracy, then you've got, you've got to represent everybody. And I think that would have been very difficult. We just found it more, we just thought it, we, it was just more practical for us to, to, to to, to not make political statements. And I also feel that, th that at the time we were, we felt that we weren't particularly qualified to make political statements. You know, we were into entertainment. Um, we didn't get into, in, into, into bands because we had big social statements to make. You know, we all, we all got into the band for different reasons. I mean, l later in life, you've, you've made some really interesting public comments about things like humanism and atheism. Right. Um, just explain that. Well, it really came through a friend of mine, Ariane Shireen. She's, um, she put together a book, was it The Atheist's Guide to Christmas, I think, and she asked me if, if I felt it was appropriate for me to, to say something, and I did. Um, because, I'm, because I've got, you know, I've got strong views on belief, um, my own belief and the belief of others as well. I think that, that, you know, first off, I think you should be allowed to believe in whatever you want to believe in, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. Um, and I also kind of, I've been through different stages of belief myself in my life. So I was very religious until, really until my mid-teens. Um, I was a member of the church choir. I, I went to church twice a week. Um, it was a big part of my life. And then I started, you know, as I, I kind of grew older, I started questioning things and, and a lot of it just didn't make sense to me. So I thought, well, just, just keep an open mind. And I think really I've, I've stayed with that open mind. I'm not an atheist. You're not an atheist? No, I wouldn't say I'm an atheist. I, I'm not, I don't have a particular I don't find great solace in the, in the, the Christian um, God and, and the way of worship. 
I have a feeling there, there, there could be something spiritual. I don't know what it is. Um, I, it's uh, just because the kind of science that, um, that we've developed and that we've grown up with as, as, as a human race seems to say there isn't any God doesn't necessarily mean that that is the case. So I, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sitting on the fence. And do you find yourself being more spiritual or interested in what comes next as, as you get older? No, no, because I, I, don't, I'm, I don't really think about what comes next because I think what happens here is the most important thing. And, and I don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about that when I could be thinking about this. Do you, are you, you strike me now as someone who kind of wants to wring every last drop of joy out of Existence. the time we have. Yeah, because I think it's an incredible thing. And is that something that you just, you, you'll carry on forever then, as long um, as you can? Yeah, I, I, I will. I mean, I just believe that consciousness is, is such an incredible gift. Um, and I think it's, it's valuable. That's, I believe life is very important. So when I see you know, what's happening in other parts of the world where life seems to be so cheap and, and, and people are getting killed, it, that really upsets me. I get very upset when, when I see how powerful people disregard the importance of other human lives. There are obviously a lot of similarities um, in Britain and, the, and, and Europe, I suppose, at the moment, in terms socially now to how things were in the 80s. A lot, a lot of, sort of social division, political yeah. strife, yeah. Uh, you know, economic difficulties. And these are traditionally creative times. Mm. Um, do you feel that at the moment? What I see is a lot of creativity in the music industry because that's what I'm focused on right now, particularly with finding new songs to put on my radio show. So the, the, it, we are living in an incredibly experimental, creative time. Um, you know, there was a time when I think uh, music got quite generic sounding, um, but, I, but now we're moving away from that into, into, into much more individual expression again, which I think you all, which, which, which I think I agree, happens when, when people are feeling oppressed. If people want to understand Duran Duran now. Right. So if you, go on, if you go on to Spotify, it gives you the top five played songs. It's quite a sort of a, an unusual five, I would say. Right. Not, it wouldn't be my five, but I, I, before I came out here, I was showing my 17 year old <laughs> okay. daughter. You know, you, we, she was going, would I know stuff? And I was like, yeah, you would, you know, girls on phone. She'd go, oh yes, know that, you know. Um, so if people want to understand Duran Duran, what are the five songs they should listen to? Ha, that's a good one. Great. Ordinary World, I think is very important. Um, Secret October, which is a B-side, way back in the 1980s. Um, why? Why that one? Because it, it just, sh it has a, gives, it, it shows how little things can be. How, how, how small and, we've been accused of being bombastic. And I don't think we are. And I think, I think Secret October really it gives you an idea of, of, of that sort of, 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 the, of the humility of music, how humble it can be, and how, hum, how humility in music can be a very powerful thing. Um, okay, that's two. Two. Now we need three more. You have three more. Um, well, we've got to have something off the new album. I say give it all up, because I love that, uh, I love that song. Um, what else? Paper Gods the title track of the album Paper Gods, because it's really good. Um, Careless Memories, I think. Or Hunger Like the Wolf. Hungry Like the Wolf. You have to have Hungry Like, hungry like the Wolf. You've got to, because you've got <laughs> to have Hungry Like the Wolf. Yeah. OK, that's, that's very useful. Finally, um, if you could change the world in any way, mm. how would you change it? I wouldn't change the world. I'd change humanity. I'd have us be less competitive. I'd have us be more evolved. You know, we need to, we need to evolve out of these atavistic um, uh, instincts, uh, fear, competition, jealousy, 
aggression. That's, that's fascinating. Is that, is that, is that, is that what you're I trying think, to... Because I think all the, really the world's problems seem to be caused by humanity. You know, if it's, whether it's climate change or war. And I think, I think that humanity could evolve to cope with those problems. Simon Le Bon, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for showing your way to change the world. <laughs>